All right. Recording now. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks. All right. Take two. This is the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee meeting. Everybody is welcome to attend and participate in this meeting so long as you abide by the antitrust policy that you'll see in the agenda and our community code of conduct that uh, uh, requires everybody to be respectful of the other contributions from the other participants here. Uh, we've got a manageable agenda today. There's a few announcements we want to get through and then uh, uh, two or three uh, more meaty discussion topics. The primary one is ARIES. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll see about getting to a uh, grid that was posted a little bit late. So I want to make sure that people had a chance to read it before we open that for questions. Uh, we'll probably hit the Salona's topic before that. All right, so uh, first things first on the announcements, congratulations to the uh, Hyperledger Transact proposal. Um, that has passed email vote uh, over the, the intervening days between our last meeting. I think that the uh, sponsors on that are ready to be patient as there's a number of things going through uh, Hyperledger staff that uh, people are uh, loaded on to, to things that happen when the project proposal comes through. So I think there's plenty of patience there to work with uh, as we get that new project underway. One of the things that I'm finding very helpful uh, as I've come back into the swing of things after having some time off is the wiki. Uh, I think going through the ARIES proposal in particular for me and, and seeing that we do inline uh, comments on that and, and seeing a whole lot more structure and rigor to the, the meetings that we have across all of the, the working groups and projects and, and seeing consistently posted agendas and minutes. Uh, I think it's working out really well for the community. So I wanted to, to take a moment and thank the team that, that put that wiki together, which is at least Salona and Rye, I believe Tracy before she moved on to other work, um, and uh, Dave, and I'm sure there's other people that, that contributed that, that uh, I don't wanna leave anybody's name out, but wanted to say thank you to everybody who, who made this tool uh, a good help for the, the projects. Thanks. Thanks to the team. Great. And I think Salona said she's going to take us through a few more features that not everybody might be widely familiar with a little later in the meeting. Uh, next up there, we've got the reminder that the CICD committee is, is ongoing. We're trying to move as rapidly uh, as possible there while still getting to a good outcome for all of the projects. So please contact Dave Hughesby if you uh, need to be in that committee and you are not yet aware of it. Uh, and then uh, Salone, if you want to take the next two announcements. Yes, thank you. So um, Contributor Summit update. Uh, we tried a lot of different things to try to figure out how to do Japan. We looked at surrounding areas. We looked at a lot of different aspects. And I'm just not able to find anything within budget um or, or within location so um we need to start regrouping in regards to what that's going to look like i've got several other proposals um one of the things that we've been doing is doing committees on different things where in the end our team kind of has to, to get the work done instead of a work group and so if anyone would like to do a contributor summit committee with me where you can help me <laughs> find things like locations and uh, stuff of that nature and make suggestions on the layout and things of that things along those lines please let me know so that I can gear you into some weekly meetings that we have I'm planning for that um, <clears throat> we do have some interesting things that are looking like in uh, September for either Vancouver or Russia or Bermuda <laughs> so um, it's, it's out there and we're, I want to get it planned sooner rather than later. Um, it, it also looks like that we'll be doing a... If you've just joined the call, please make sure that you are muted so your background noise isn't disrupting the meeting. Thank you. Um, and uh, we are also going to be doing a boot camp in Brazil. 
uh, Karen's on the phone call. She's talked to a bunch of different um, participants in Brazil that are interested. We've thrown up an informal wiki space and we're planning out our session leaders now. If you have any contacts in Brazil, um, especially for any of the project leads so that we can make sure that all the projects are represented, please contact me so I can put you on the, the major. So the Brazil project is available. It's just not linked to, so I can share the link with you. And then I do have a private page on the session leaders because we are putting in like contact info and phone numbers and emails and things of that nature. So I'm not going to make that public, but it's, you know, public private, I guess, and that anyone who wants to get on there and help plan and add contacts and do stuff like that, um, I can share that with you if you've got some people down there that um, you want to make sure get incorporated early in the process. And that's looking like the end of June. So was there anything that you wanted to say, Karen? Hi, everyone. Um, no, I just wanted to uh, reiterate Salona's call for anyone who's interested in helping out, um, being a mentor, um, or being a session leader. We'd yeah, when one of the things that we're doing that's a little different here is we know that not all the projects can send people down to Brazil for this boot, boot camp, but you can mentor people. And I believe Silas and I, we talked about that, um, where you can kind of basically train somebody up to lead a session. And we're even talking about training some people up who are, you know, um, uh, multilingual and can speak, you know, both English and Portuguese so that they can actually lead some sessions in Portuguese as well, just like we did with China and Chinese. So that'd be great. And, and can you remind us the full picture of boot camps for the year? Are we doing two of these, three of these? We're going to try to do three. Um, uh, but uh, three, three that Hyperledger pays for. Uh, but we're actually doing a lot more than that. So we've already done the one in Hong Kong, and then there was the Indy one that was the BC Gov. And then we are doing um, two at DEF CON and DEF CON China, by, um, which, is, which we are not actually running, but we're working with them. It's a guy that's super experienced. He's been doing villages at DEF CON for like 15 years. So I have no questions about his capabilities of running this. And then um, we're also doing one in Denver during Denver Startup Week. And then we're going to be doing one other that we will be supporting more of the budget for. And I'm not exactly sure when that's going to be yet, uh, but it'll be in the fall. Okay. And so for the ones that, that Hyperledger isn't funding, uh, it's still taking some staff time to do some facilitation. Yes, it's not it's not nearly as the same amount of heavy lift as the other ones are in that we don't go for complete representation of projects. And so a lot of them end up being specialized, like the ones at DEF CON are probably going to be more um, Ursa in focus. Um, and then the one at uh, Denver is going to be more Indie in focus. Uh, but there's a few other projects who also said that they wanted to participate. So it's less it's more about the ones that Hyperledger does is focused on getting content together that the others can use. So um, it becomes less of a heavy lift because it's not about having all the maintainers attending and all the maintainers having to make sure they get their content ready and things of that nature. It's about reusing the content that's created at the other ones. Okay, great. Um, Hart, that might be a good FYI for the next uh, URSA meeting is to give the heads up on the DEF CON one. Sure, I assume Dave Hughesby is in the loop on this. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so we'll yep. have him give that. Uh, he can, Dave, can you update that at the next Ursa meeting? Yep. Awesome, thanks a lot. Great. All right, thanks, Alona. Uh, all right, we're gonna move on into the ARIES proposal discussion now. I hope everybody has had an opportunity to take a look at the proposal that is posted to the wiki. There's a checklist on the bottom, and I know this is uh, new for everybody. That checklist is meant to indicate that you have had 
uh, a chance to read through the proposal. It does not indicate that you are voting in favor of it. Uh, it's just intended as a tracking mechanism so we know that we're ready to have a discussion. Uh, so I'm hoping that it's been read through by everybody at this point, and uh, it's just uh, that people haven't necessarily marked that they have read it. Uh, thank you for the gesturing on the screen. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit ago, I, I think it's great that we can, we can actually uh, highlight text in there, and then you can do inline comments, just like what we would have done through Google Docs. Uh, and I think that's a good way to get a lot of questions answered offline. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to um, to Nathan at this point to uh, refresh everybody on on the proposal and walk through any open comments. So uh, the, the inline comments have worked very well. Um, we tried to get back to those as quickly, as quickly as we could as they came in. Um, most of them were just clarification questions around specific language in the document. Um, I think a couple of the points of clarification to talk to with everyone is that, uh, yes, it is kind of a client tool suite, or a, uh, and if, but also in some ways a framework as well because it provides um, a bunch of library code that's consumed then in other, um, other systems. So, for example, this project wouldn't be producing an iOS or an Android app, but it is producing all the framework code necessary to build such an app. Um, by including that framework code inside of whatever iOS or Android app you were using for your mobile. Um, and uh, it, it, we're, we are also targeting more than one chain than just Indy. Um, here at IAW this week, there's been a lot of discussion about the overlap on how messaging between wallets or different agents work one to another, um, and a lot of consensus on the approach that's been taken and incubated already at Indy that's moving into this area's project. And that's one of the main reasons why this is moving into its own project and not staying inside of Indy is to make sure that that um, project and that uh, maintainership is friendly and neutral regarding the different blockchains that we'll be supporting and that that framework will be usable for those different products that are um, happening all over the marketplace right now. And if you look in the, the sponsors section of the document, you'll notice that there's folks from all over the community that have signed up to sponsor. We have Obviously, Troy that works already with the Fabric team that's looking to do some interesting things with the project, um, but also um, several different folks who are building um, mobile apps for wallets or enterprise apps for enterprise data management and data sharing. Um, and all of the folks that are listed here are actually already active in the project. Most of them already have code commits or are active in the calls and contributions to the architecture documentation and elsewhere. So. Um, it's a pretty good group that's already working on this, um, and uh, I hope that if you don't have, have a question in, in line that hasn't been addressed to your satisfaction, you can ask. Go ahead and ask that now. This is Chris. So um, it's not a wallet. <laughs> it's got a lot of attributes of a wallet. It's really, I mean, the way that it's described, <clears throat> and again, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but the way that it's described, it sounds almost like part of one's SDK. And um, I, I don't understand how you're going to do that if, <clears throat> unless you're going to have flavors of this in just about every language you can conceive. Well, uh, it's actually written in Rust, and it's compilable down to C. And yeah, then, I'm, I'm getting a little bit tired of that because, I mean, come on, that's just not, it, it really isn't all that realistic. So uh, we've been shipping code on top of this inside of Indy for some time. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, I know that that's a different approach than some of the other platforms have taken, um, but we certain ha certainly had a lot of success with it with what we've been doing so far. And what's Chris, the breadth what's, of language what's not realistic? You currently, what's the breadth of language support you currently have on your clients for Indy? Um, is it just Rust or? So the main code is all in Rust, and that makes it so that we can expose the functionality in all the different languages. We have really strong wrappers for .NET, Java, um, iOS, Android, um, uh, Python, and Node.js, and then there are also uh, wrappers in PHP, Ruby, um, and uh, I think there's two or Go is um, 
those are the, I would call, say, tier two wrappers. They're, they're not updated as frequently as the others, um, but they are active and people are using them in production systems. So, so you have demonstrated that you're capable of, of putting multiple, yeah. multiple language wrappers around? Every language that's on the list here is already like, supported <clears throat> and has maintainers within the incubated code in Indy. Okay. Because I'm, I in general, I completely agree with Chris that just because it's Rust does not mean that it's easy to put some place, something else around it in order to build in your language. Yeah, and I don't know that I have any objection to that opinion one way or the other. Um, other than this is what we're doing in practice now, and it seems to be working. So I have an objection about it, but I'll take it off the line with you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think the next level up of abstraction from that is the the APIs that you would have to call through in order to do the the resolving with different types of blockchains. So you'd want to be able to uh, call into the Fabric API, uh, an Ethereum API, Sawtooth API, and so forth. Uh, so could you talk about the ability to do that with with this future project versus uh, the commitments to build that out. Yeah, um, and this is actually the area where we expect a lot of new development to occur within this project. Is one of the main scope changes versus the code that's already been written inside of Indy. Um, we have the peer did resolver, um, which uses the local wallet for doing all of its key management, um, and that code um, has forced us to do a refactor on how we, re we get things off of the verifiable data registry for the identity, key ma the key management and definitions and schemas and so forth um, to where it has an abstraction layer that can then have other systems plug in. Um, the first systems that I expect we'll be targeting here are the resolver that the various one folks want to contribute. Um, their interface is more of a REST based interface, so it should be a fairly simple implementation. Um, and then there are, there's one for the ET, ETHR um, did method um, that uses IPFS um, for resolving uh, the did document. Um, and then there are a couple others that are, will be based off of the code that's already been implemented over at the Decentralized Identity Foundation, where we're going to be popping the code out of the, the Docker container based system that they're using over there and moving it down into the Rust code um, so that it can be part of the native platform. Um, inside the system. So we know we have um, code that we can use as a reference um, to add this to the code base for the resolvers that already exist over there at DIFF. Um, I have a tentative commitment from Marcus Sabadella who maintains the universal resolver over there to help be the maintainer over this interface here inside of the Ares project. Um, and so we're hoping that moving the ones that are inside of the DIFF code base over to be natively supported inside of this project will be a straightforward um, process. And then um, I'm, all, I'm very hopeful that um, with Troy's help and some of the help of the folks that are involved in how Fabric has been doing um, its identity support that we can um, add some did identity model work um, for transactions that occur inside of Fabric. Um, I don't know what the timeline for those will be. Obviously, how many of those we support and how quickly we support them will depend a lot on what sort of you know, investment we get from those um, parts of the community. Obviously, if you look at the diagram, we call out that we expect the resolvers themselves to live inside of the projects. Um, and then the resolver interface is what lives in the Aries layer. So resolvers that are pure client to client will live inside of Aries' code base. And then the resolvers that are for other chains, I expect they'll either live inside of the, the project itself. India is a good example here. Or that they'll live inside of um, uh, like a Hyperledger Labs project or um, some repository for just doing a decentralized identifier type identity use cases on top of that chain. And, and so should we interpret that meaning then that the, the kind of schemas that that code is meant to go do um, gets and sets on is it should be sort of centered around the identifier types of schemas? That's correct. So the idea is that it follows the decentralized identifier standard um, in terms of how it handles its, um, its key management and then for verifiable credentials exchange that we're following the pattern that's set in the um, W3C verifiable credential spec. So nobody should be thinking of this then as sort of a general purpose client to go out and talk to all blockchains for all matters. Sort of the, the raison d'etre for, for this project is to provide um, 
a lot of standardized ways to go out and get identity styles of schemas from a variety of different blockchains. So that is the main focus, though, if you go look at the, the call out of scope, our expectation is that you'll have a, a simple client that just can sign and submit transactions to a blockchain. So you could use it for that type of a, an application. Um, we also expect that we would then, from that base class, build the verifiable data registries interface um, that will handle DIDs and DID documents and um, things like schema definitions, credential definitions, the things we use for verifiable credentials. And then the, the third type of interface we expect to have is a payment interface um, that will allow for transferring things like um, tokenized assets as part of verifiable credentials exchange. Um, though that would also be usable in a standalone way to say, I just want to transfer some Bitcoin from address A to address B. So as long as you had the base transaction resolver and then a payment resolver, you could transfer something like a crypto asset using this project. Um, but like you said, Dan, our, our main focus is this idea of verifiable inf credentials or verified data exchange between edge, edge clients. Hi, this is Silas. Um, I have a sort of understanding related question. Is this in, entirely meant to be driven by, I know it typically an indie wallet is working as a user agent. Uh, some of the scope with the peer-to-peer -peer messaging and possibly the, the the transfer between different blockchains it sounds like it could sort of be used machine to machine or, or used as a library in a node or something it, yeah. Absolutely. Can you that? right um, so we think of the the client layer as it could represent a person an organization or a thing um, so we don't make a clear distinction on whether this um, wallet is uh, which type of entity this wallet is representing um, so it is accurate to say that it can be used for that the other thing that it's clear to us it is in the long term, um, this is not the short term goal of the project, but in the long term, you end up having more than one machine that represents a particular user or organization. For example, I might have my phone and my laptop and my cloud server. And as I have to do synchronization between the wallet contents between those different um, um, compute units, um, I end up building the, essentially an ordering and a gossip protocol and some form of consensus to say which changes I should accept and which I should reject. So you, you do end up with some of the base building blocks for doing kind of node to node types of things. For the indie project, we do expect that in the, the long run, we may consider rebuilding the, the node code on top of the agent code. Um, and we can start considering the, the ledger state as effectively the shared wallet amongst all validators. And then um, you end up with uh, agents that are used to build ledgers as opposed to ledgers that are there to support agents. Um, but we're not really sure how that will play out. Um, that's just a thought of what could be possible once this gets to a full, you know, active, um, stable release. Okay, interesting. Um, the, the other question I had was about the, I think you said that with some interest in you implementing WebAuthn, OpenID Connect, but you don't have an enough maintainer interest or something what, what would it take well, to, to build yeah so since i wrote that um we've had a lot of discussions with a company out of iowa called id ramp um and they actually have gone ahead and built um sso integration using verifiable credentials um so i expect that they're going to be upgrading their proof of concept to use the agent framework that's written in c sharp um and uh contributing back some of the code that allows that interfacing to work um to the project. So um, we're seeing actually some good activity on that now. I haven't signed them up as a maintainer or gotten them to sponsor on this project list yet, um, but they're really excited to, to participate. Thanks. I'd just like to finish rounding out some of the thoughts about the cross project or at least cross blockchain uh, implications. So for the, the kind of code that would reside in another infrastructure, another blockchain project, what kind of code would that be? What would that look like? Um, so it would need to be uh, a, an implementation that sits behind the interface. Um, the expectation is we're going to do um, kind of a, a shared object or a library load call in order to invoke that interface. So whatever you, you did to implement the resolver interface would have to compile down to something that was uh, C callable. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, it, 
the ideal way to do it is if you wrote it in Rust, then we could call it in natively and we could help preserve some of the type trait guarantees across that boundary. Um, but uh, there's certainly more options than that, depending on what um, your blockchain likes to do for that sort of thing. So somebody would then grab some library code from Ares, some library code from say Fabric, uh, and then have a little mini integration project to create a client that's able to make use of the Ares functionality in interacting with a fabric. That's right. So I think this is an interesting project for sure. I, I, you know, I still struggle with the, with the more general question about how we manage the different projects within Hyperledger. Um, it's clear that historically we've been creating these projects with hope that they will be used by different projects and kind of, you know, wishful thinking type of thing. And I still wonder, or question whether this is the right approach. And, you know, my question fundamentally is, does this really need to be, you know, externalized from Indy or should it not in a way prove itself first and, you know, live within Indy, the, everything can be done so it's isolated from the rest of Indy and be, exposed to the projects, integration with other projects can happen. And then if it really ends up working with different projects, we can say, okay, now this thing is much bigger than what Indy does with it. It is worth externalizing it. And I mean, for that matter, we have at least one case where it is already like this. Uh, we have integration of the borough EVM with Sawtooth and Fabric, and we haven't externalized the borough EVM out of borough for that matter. Maybe we will at some point, I don't know. And so, you know, and please don't take it personally, it's not specific to this project. I just, it just raised that same question again. And, you know, I've yeah. been, Well, and I think that this is an important question we always need to ask with a new project. Um, we've had it in the past where we've had projects that really struggled to maintain sufficient maintainership and sufficient integration into the projects that they have dependencies with. Um, for that very reason. Um, in particular, for the Aries project, we've gotten to the point where the Aries calls have grown to have more than 30 or 40 regular participants in their calls, which right now are called the Indie Agent Working Group call. Um, and so the management of this code base relative to the management of the Indie code base has become rather difficult um, because there's enough going on on both sides of the fence that the coordination between the two has become, um, become harder. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we, we thought that adding this new project proposal would be very helpful. And the other we're hearing from folks who want to do the collaborative contributions of other code is they have this impression that Indy is only about the ledger um, and they have a hard time distinguishing whether they're trying to pick up the project to build their own blockchain or if they're trying to pick up the project to do um, this type of key management and information exchange. And we think this clarifies the scope of what the end users are trying to accomplish in a way that helps us attract more of those sorts of contributors and also remove some of the barriers from the people who said, well, I, I want to contribute some code, but I wasn't sure if this was the right place. So, <clears throat> Nathan, if I just heard you correctly, and maybe I misheard you, you just said that it's getting difficult to manage coordination between essentially the agent and the rest of Indy. Making a separate project is going to improve that? Um, what I mean by that is uh, there's a different set of features that have to land in order on the, the, the what it would be the Aries side of the project than what there is on the Indy side of the project. Um, the type of work that's going on inside of Indy is related to the consensus algorithm, the signature scheme, and the type of work that's coming on here is mostly related to what we call message families support um, and peer-to-peer um, -peer protocols in terms of the JSON specifications for those different types of protocols. And so the the... The, the quantity of information being discussed in terms of standards track inside of the, this part of the project is squeezing out a lot of the discussions that need to happen in terms of the ledger and what's going on for um, the 
you know, like batch ordering integrity and things like that on the, the ledger side. And so splitting them off into their own meetings allow them to both have sufficient time to discuss the, the active development work. Okay, but to be fair, I mean, you don't need to have two different projects to have different meetings. I mean, the fabric community has different projects going on and they don't all meet at the same time. Huh? Independently of what happens with this project, you could decide to have two calls a week or whatever it takes to. Yeah. You know. No objection there. We're, I think we're up to about six or seven yeah. <laughs> across the whole indie community. Okay, that makes sense actually. No, I do think that, you know, one point you raised, which I think is valid, is the, you know, the communication aspect. I think the, you know, externalizing a project like this definitely, you know, strong, send a strong message that, you know, about the scope and the dependence that is actually at least meant or perceived, you know, uh, that you don't have when things are still tied together, at least in name, if nothing else. So that's definitely, to me, the biggest argument to externalize some of these projects. The, the, the downside is what we've seen before when, you know, we, we kind of take a bet on how we things should play out and they don't always do. And, you know, and then we still end up with things like we have, where we have projects that on paper are supposed to be independent, but in practice are not, which I think is not ideal. I agree with that sentiment, and that's one of the things um, we're, we'll work really closely with the maintainers of both on um, to recruit and keep the the commitment of, of Aries to be cross-ledger. Um, and like I say, it's one of the discussions we've had a lot of here at um, IAW this week in Mountain View, California. Uh, is there several other verifiable data registries and applications that need this type of um, uh, library code, but that are not either a traditional blockchain the way we would think of them at Hyperledger, or are not something that would participate directly in the in the the node side or the verifiable data registry development side of the system. Okay. Thanks. I don't think this would need to block moving forward with with the proposal written as is, but maybe give some additional thought to whether the repo structuring for this would facilitate blockchain code from from the various blockchains that people are interested in supporting. So not that we necessarily need to obligate this project team with implementing those integration points. Uh, but I think that if there's a, a way to house all that code together. It seems like you'd get better uptake than, than having maybe a two or three point integration where somebody has to pull in Aries code themselves and Sawtooth code themselves and then whatever sort of client they're, they're making. I like that feedback, especially for some of the projects that are not doing um, you know, Apache 2 license DCO approvals and things like that in their repositories, giving them a home inside of this project could help them with that process. Um, the thing that we wanted to call out in the project proposal is that projects don't have to do that. Um, the architecture doesn't require it. Um, so um, we want to make sure that we're friendly to the other options as well. Um, but I, I think that's a, a good point. So, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still smarting from the whole composer um, sort of situation where you know I think we went in with I think the best of intentions and nothing happened when it comes to seeding it on other projects and there was some expectation that um, you know that the composer team was going to do that and um, I'm I'm still struggling I mean you know I see Troy for fabric and uh, I don't know if we have anybody from Borough on here. I don't know that I see anybody. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, from Aroha, I don't know if I see anybody. I, I don't see any familiar names anyway. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm still struggling with, you know, the point that, that Arno was on, which is, you know, why not just do this inside Indy? And then if it starts getting used, maybe that's the time to start considering that it's a separate thing. Um, so we are kind of already at that point. We've been doing this in Indy for some time. And the folks that you're likely to see that are doing other blockchain-based resolvers are not the familiar faces that you're used to inside of Hyperledger. Um, they're folks that right now feel like they can't contribute directly to Indy because they would be materially supporting the Indy ledger. Um, but they're now to the point in their development where they need to pick up the, the decentralized management parts of the infrastructure and the agent-to-agent -agent messaging pieces in the infrastructure. And there's um, broad consensus uh, on the way that those protocols are being built. And there's a lot of agreement around how those RFCs have come together inside of the Indy Hype repository. Um, but because they see the Indy Hype repository is centered on the Indy ledger in particular, um, they've hesitated to participate in that process. Um, and by moving it over into the Aries um, project and having a different moniker and branding for it, um, those folks seem to be much more willing to participate in the conversation here at Hyperledger and join in what's going on. What's what's the current state in uh, in integration with Ethereum? Would that be for resolvers, or or how would that how would that work? Yeah, that would be for resolvers. Um, the Uport built a resolver that was specifically for the Uport DID method, and they've since um, done a lot of work to rewrite that as the ETHR um, method on top of uh, um, of Ethereum, and it. The, this is one of the reasons why resolvers can be rather complicated because you can't store the entirety of the did document on side, inside of that, those, some of those ledgers. Instead, they use uh, a hash that's on the ledger for the proof of existence and then point to some external storage and then they have to resolve or reference the hashes between those systems in order to construct a DID document that they can return to you that you can then verify or, or, or validate. Um, and so um, the expectation is that um, those resolvers um, will be able to fit underneath this interface. Um, with both Bitcoin and Ethereum, you usually have to run a full node in order to do the full validation. Um, there's some work at trying to figure out how to make a, a thin node do similar validation with less trust guarantees. Um, so uh, it's unclear which of those um, uh, implementations of the resolver would, will fit over on this side. Um, but I expect that we'll be able to write a thin client resolver that would um, go into this code base. Okay, it sounds like questions are winding down. Uh, TSC members, do we feel like we're ready for moving into a voting phase here? Uh, or does anyone feel like uh, they have outstanding questions that, that still need resolution? Um, I will say just as a, as a general comment, this discussion has been extremely helpful in understanding why this needs to be a separate and distinct project. Um, we don't really have a way of capturing that in the proposals, although it's becoming more and more critical to the discussions we're having. So we might want to think about how to capture that ahead of time. Um, in the future as well. That being said, I'm real comfortable with this. Um, and Nathan and I have talked several times about how to incorporate some of this work into R. So um, I, I, I'm comfortable. So Mick, you want me to add a question to the forum? Um, uh, we can talk yeah. about this off. We can talk about this offline. But I, but the the last three proposals that have come up. The critical part of the discussion has been um, something about how it relates to and why it is a distinct project. So I, I definitely think this should be a part of the form. Yes. So. so ping me on chat and uh, uh, yeah, we'll get in there. Okay. Thanks, guys.
All right, well, not hearing any uh, further questions or objections into moving into a vote. Why don't we go ahead and uh, take a roll vote here? Salona, do you want to run through the, the roster? Sure. Um, first of all, did we want to do the whole someone asked for a vote and someone uh, seconds it? I propose we <laughs> vote on the I propose we vote on the proposal. Thank I you. I'm trying to get to my little checklist and it's not letting me get to my little checklist. Um, so you want me to go through each member instead of us doing the I's and A's and abstaining? Is that what you're saying, Dan? Yeah, we can do it either way. It doesn't really matter uh, if there's some lack of clarity on, on doing all in favor and, and opposed uh, and do it individually. I think it's just clearer to do it individually since it is a conference call. Okay, I don't have. Uh, sorry, I don't have my my rye here. <laughs> so um, the list calling, is at the bottom of the proposal. Yeah, that that's where I'm at. That's why I scrolled down to. So Arnold. Yes, with the with the hesitation that I already expressed. And by the way, I would add a comment if I may interject. You know, I think I would feel more comfortable going forward with this kind of projects if we were a bit more um, agile in recognizing when things don't work out and need to be taken back. So maybe that's food for thought. Awesome. Uh, uh, uh -huh. are, are you, is, yeah. Yeah, I heard the, the proposal, um, but I, I think uh, uh, maybe maybe we can make the decision uh, later, like uh, maybe next week, because it seems there's a lot of uh, discussion on this proposal and uh, uh, still yeah. still some uh, open questions. Yeah, yeah I, I, I didn't... <laughs> I'm very reluctant, sorry, this is Silas, to, to sort of delay it. And, and part of that is I only, only got a chance myself to look at this. I've been away so, so earlier today. I'm almost sure that I, I would like to support the proposal. I really wouldn't mind another week uh, to, to understand some of the bits and uh, more fully support it. I'm happy to retract my vote in support of delaying by a week. <laughs> I don't think it will change my position, but. Well, and that's my question. I mean, if it's about understanding the technical um, details of the project, I'm certainly happy to work with folks on that. Um, procedurally here, um, I'm really eager to get to where we have uh, a project that has some approval. Um, in particular, we're here at IAW right now. We have the last day of the conference ahead of us and an approval would really help me in terms of recruiting more maintainers. I'm here at IIW and so is Hughesby and we're actually doing some did work. Um, so, yeah. All right, <laughs> um, that, that's good enough for me then. Uh, all right, so I, I lost track of, was it Bao Wow, were you requesting that we, we defer this for a week until your comments are resolved? Yeah, I, I think so. Okay, well, f feel free to speak up a little uh, earlier next time when we ask for that comment specifically. Um, okay, um, Ben? Is Ben on? I don't know, I'm looking right now. I don't see him as being on. So he's not here, Chris? Um, <clears throat> I have um, similar reservations that I expressed earlier, but I'll I'll say yes. I I 
I tend to agree though that I think um, you know we need to maybe do a little bit of a think about you know just how we manage these and just what is the criteria for becoming a top level I'm you know again I, I, I we, we, we've got a ton of stuff that's still in incubation and and we keep you know churning out new incubations and I'm just not sure we're really sustaining the, the everything correctly so so that, that kind of sounded like yes but no it, it, it no it sounds like a yes but I really think okay. that we ought to have a really <clears throat> you know I, I think we should have a good discussion about just how we intend to manage all these projects and how we intend in particular to start getting a little bit more synergy across these projects <clears throat> because we keep coming forward with oh we'll do this and it'll land on top of this that and the other thing and it never happens so just to be concrete about this Salona can we add something into the backlog for future topics that is specifically um, a topic about how we manage the strategy for um, retiring incubation projects that are inactive and how we manage sub projects. And I don't know if this is, I don't know if Chris, you want to take ownership of this, but I will help you if you want preparations for the discussion or if you just want to have it as an open discussion. Yeah. I, I have an email that I want to send about, about this too. So. Okay. That's great. Uh, I think we've, we've had some, um, backlog item on that and and we do need to have some prepared agenda items so it's not a free form discussion at that time however we are in the middle of a vote so yeah no I, i'm just i'm just saying we're reluctant yes i mean i like <laughs> the idea of the project don't get me wrong but i also you know would like to have a better clue on how we we deal with things when they don't work out the way they thought Okay, so the way that we're gonna run through the rest of the vote, uh, everybody's had an opportunity to comment and second opportunities and third opportunities to make comments. So I'd like to just run through the, the rest of the roster here and get everybody's yay or nay votes. Uh, and then we can proceed into other agenda items. You're juggling a few things there. Salona, are you ready to uh, move forward Sorry. on this? Yeah, so I'm trying to um, take some notes. So it sounds like uh, we're at you, Dan. Yep. Uh, yes, in favor of the proposal. Uh, Hart? Yes. Um, Kelly? Yes. Uh, Mark? Yay! <laughs> Mick? Yes. <laughs> Let me guess, Nathan? Yes. <laughs> and Silas? Yes, but no, just yes. <laughs> Sorry, you made me snort. All right, thanks, guys. Uh, I got the votes. It passes. All right, congratulations to the Aries proposal. Thank you, everybody. And uh, um, I look forward to the discussion on how we manage life cycle of projects. I think that's, it. that's a very important point. Yes. Um, so do we want to do wikis or let's, do, let's get Grid in there? I, or, or I guess Grid did post late. Um, yeah, I'd rather go ahead and uh, give you uh, the remaining time here to talk about the wiki and the processes. Okay, cool. So um, with some of the wiki, it was brought to my attention that there were some changes that not everyone was aware of that we had gone and implemented. Um, we went through and took full advantage of all the new features that exist in Confluence. One thing for y'all to note about doing this Confluence aspect is that um, because we are open source, Basically, all the bells and whistles that exist on Confluence, we can normally get for free. And so um, always ask if you sit there and know about something that's new and interesting that you would like to have. And my team can sit there and we can see about getting it implemented or not. And so one of the ones that I've been highlighting a lot to people is the fact that we do have 
you know, the collaborative editing, which can handle up to 12 people on a page at the same time, which is basically kind of like the Google Docs where everyone can be in there editing all at the same time. And you'll sit there and you'll see it if you click on edit. And up here, you'll watch a bunch of different names starting to pop up and you can all get in there together and edit. And so it ends up being really useful. The other thing that I'd really like to highlight um, for, you know, all of the nerds on here is this button right here. Be careful, it's the in-source editor, but if you go in and look at it, you can sit there and get down to what's basically HTML, JavaScript, and you know, program away for anything that you need to get in there and fix or do something special or things of, those, of that nature. Sometimes I notice the code will get a little wonky and I can just go in there and do it by hand and get it all straightened out. Uh, now I can't see my button. Um, so that's pretty darn handy and a power user move. Um, the other thing is, is on these editors, you have macros. And on these macros, there's a lot of really good, interesting things in there. Probably the biggest one for a lot of you guys is the fact that we do have the glyphy diagrams, which means y'all can edit diagrams together, which you really don't actually have that functionality in any of the Google documentation. So I highly recommend going in there and trying that out. You can also do basalmic wireframes for your project leads, where if you do want to sit there and wireframe some of the stuff out, you can also do that collaboratively, um, where you can insert it and then other people can help edit it, which I think is a huge win that you also don't get in a Google Doc. Um, and then there's a bunch of other macros that you've probably actually noticed on some of the spaces that I've created for some of the projects and some of the work groups and SIGs in that you can do things like there is the stuff for doing the notes, there's the checkbox lists that we're using for if someone's read anything. Um, very important, there's the I like cheese macro. Um, there are <laughs> the children's display, which is basically automatically shows um, the children pages that exist under the different pieces. So there's a lot of stuff that's there. Um, so I think you'll find that there's actually more stuff that you can do here than you can get done in Google. Um, it's just a little bit obtuse sometimes to find it. Um, it's not you, it's it. Um, <clears throat> and then what I've done for all the projects is I've done something that's called spaces, which basically means you have a fair amount of autonomy on these spaces where you don't have to worry about naming collisions anymore. You don't have to worry about any of that. And if you need, I can create special permissions for those spaces too. Um, so that like, for example, right now, the San Paulo bootcamp space is not viewable to people who don't have LFIDs because we haven't published it yet. And so it's not very findable and we've done that on purpose to help with you know, those events getting launched. Um, we've created individual projects, of course, for all of the all independent spaces for all of the projects so you can really get in there and do a lot of stuff and in fact right now I'm signing a contract with a contractor to do github to jira to confluence integrations and the very first one we're going to be working on is fabric um, because they've already got their stuff ready and so they can more easily publish all of their planning documentations within confluence to the greater public so that people can sit there and see all the different diverse projects that they're working on um, and then just in regards to the TSC itself, um, under projects, we've now got the project life cycle and the proposals. And on the proposals, you have the ability to create the form. And that's the form that I'm talking about changing and adding those extra fields to. And y'all can tell me all about that and easily suggest it. Um, we have the project updates. And so once again, it has the form to fill out. And as you can see, the people that have already been doing this one, this one links to the old ones, um, but that's how you can get to, you know, Grid's new um, project update. And normally we explain that in an email. We also make it, we've also done similar things for the special interest groups so that they can propose new groups. And the working groups can also um, go through that proposal process. And then they also have the TSC updates forms as well. So I've tried to make everything a little bit easier for everyone so that they can actually see where everything is, when it's coming, what the things are on the forms, and get everything done more easily. 
once um, the new groups and some of these other things happen, it triggers some stuff and it triggers some stuff for my team and the marketing team. And these are the um, checklists. And so what we've done, and this is also some of the readiness stuff that Dave Hughesby is working on so that we can actually go through and start doing checklists for when things get triggered. Like, so for example, with Aries, um, if you notice on this checklist, it's things that my team has to do, LFIT has to do, and marketing and PR. And so we go through um, a different, we go through this process to um, make sure that everything gets taken care of when something is launched and nothing's forgotten. And it's public and everyone can track it and see what everyone's doing. So um, yeah, we've worked really hard on trying to codify all of this. We do the same thing for a new working group, um, special interest groups, um, major releases, things of that nature. So you can kind of get a little bit into um, what it is that we're all working on. Um, are there any questions? Um, I would certainly like to hear more about the possibilities with project integration uh, at the next call, if, if we have time in the next agenda, which I think we probably will. Uh, we are at the end of the time here, so we'll not be able to dig into that further. Yeah, it depends on how fast I get with the contractor because I'm hoping that the contractor will already done. So we're actually um, drinking our own Kool-Aid or, or eating our own dog food or drinking our own wine. I don't know, whichever one you want. Um, with uh, the, the contractor themselves is actually going to be putting, she's going to be putting all of her code in GitHub. She's going to be setting up a JIRA project. She's going to have a page on the wiki and she's going to show how that all connects together both in the code and it as an exam working example. And we're actually going to be paying her that way where every single time she completes the Jira user story, that's the statement of work. And so that way we can do this very granularly and other projects as they did do the different okay. specifications can easily reuse what she's done. All right, thank you, Salona. Uh, we're out of time today. Thanks for everybody's participation and continue to uh, uh, continue any other further discussion in chat and on the mail lists. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.